So let's pray. Father, we present ourselves to you. We pray that you would lay your hands upon each one of us. Without the witness of the Holy Spirit, Lord, this is just the mind of man in the arm of flesh. And we pray, Lord, that you would send us deeper than ever before, enable us to know the great joy of gathering closer to you day by day. We ask that all that you have prepared for us will be a reality and that we might know your voice and know the path that we're being sent down. Increase our faith, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we will begin with Matthew. The four Gospels are sometimes characterized along with, uh, we saw it in the book of Revelation, I think it's also in Isaiah, where there is an, a creature that has four images, four representations of animals and, and a man. So it's an eagle, an ox, a man, and uh, a lion. And so Bible scholars throughout the ages, given that it's four, they estimate, are each of those four descriptive of the four Gospels? And if you go look, if you look through a list of those who have done it in the past, even a thousand, almost two thousand years ago, um, because of what's on their heart and what they feel is best represented, they make their assignment, and uh, so it's not one voice. And so, I've done that here. I've uh, mine lines up with uh, Augustine uh, by chance, and so we can. Uh, go through them just one at a time. First off is that the lion represents Matthew because uh, Matthew's gospel depicts Christ's royal character. And it, one of the greatest themes is the discussion concerning the kingdom of God and the kingdom of uh, uh, heaven. Mark, on the other hand, um, portrays the humanity of Christ. And it, uh, he starts right off, no preliminaries like the rest of them have, and just begins to uh, describe what it is that Jesus does. And uh, he focuses on the things that uh, Jesus did. Luke is like an ox. He is, uh, because Christ is shown in his priestly characters as as a burden bearer. And uh, finally, John the Eagle, and most, most agree on the Eagle, but uh, a couple, actually a number didn't agree. But John is ethereal. John is high and exalted and lofty. And uh, so he portrays the mystery of the gospel and, and its relationship to heavenly things. So maybe you could take your shot at it. So chapter one, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And Matthew describes a genealogy that many have analyzed. It's not um, clear. It's enigmatic. Uh, why things are crafted the way they are. And the secular scholars make fun of it, and they say, no, it's just uh, man-made and not inspired by God, and they're just making mistakes. So we'll, we'll look at some of that. So here is the genealogy, and it begins with Abraham and ends up with the birth of Jesus. But Luke, which also has a uh, genealogy has two differences. One is it goes backwards. It starts with Jesus and moves back, gets to David, and then it keeps on going to Adam. And so these two genealogies are the same when you get to David, but after David, they are different. David had more than one son. 
and some feel that uh, it's possible that the genealogy we're going to read here is essentially the genealogy of, of David down through Joseph. And that Luke, the one that goes the other way around, because there's a little play on words, they believe that uh, it's the genealogy of Mary. And that's why it's different until it gets to David. Uh, traditionally, the mother and father of Mary is uh, Joaquin and uh, Anna. And so those two names don't appear in the list. And so uh, it's enigmatic. So Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. And Judas begat Pharis and Zarah of Thamar. And you might remember Thamar. Uh, she was uh, Judas's uh, daughter-in-law. And her husband died. And in Jewish law, another brother is supposed to step up and bring forth children. But when she married... Uh, he died almost immediately. And so, uh, so another brother was chosen and uh, he said, no, I, I won't do it. <laughs> you can forget it. So with that, the burden fell then on uh, Judas and, uh, and he refused. So he's, he's on the hook. So what, uh, Thamar did was she dressed up as a harlot, went out on the street, and she enticed Judas and had a child. And so later on, her pregnancy gets known, and of course, he's furious and uh, condemns her. And it actually, if, had it, if it had continued, she, uh, she would have been put to death. But then she produces uh, items that belong to him, and then he realized whoops, <laughs> uh, I got caught. So, so the, the, the law was fulfilled. And there are, uh, I think there are four women that are mentioned uh, in uh, these genealogies. And so I, I think the reason for that is that there's a special place for them. Generally speaking, that if someone begats, it's, it's usually the fatherly position. Uh, one scholar felt that the word begat could also apply to grandfather uh, as well as a father. So Pharaoh begat Ezram, and Ezram begat Aram, and Aram begat Aminadab, and Aminadab begat Nason, Nason begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Boaz of Rahab. So, uh, Rahab is uh, another woman that's selected. And so uh, Rahab, it then turns out, is uh, right in the line of Ruth and David. And so the uh, early in my Christian walk, I fantasized, I was hoping that Rahab might have married one of the 12 spies. That just seemed to me to be so romantic. <laughs> but if you look up the names, that, that didn't happen. So it's like, yeah. So Salmon begat Oabs of Rahab, and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David the king. And so Ruth is the great-grandmother of David. And so David... The king begat Solomon, and so in the Luke uh, genealogy that goes backwards, it doesn't go through Solomon. It goes through one of the other sons of David, and then it, it locks in when it gets back to Abraham. But the Luke keeps going until it gets to uh, Adam. And he begat Solomon of her, here's another lady, that had been the wife of Urias. And so the Lord doesn't even mention Bathsheba. Just, it's like, 
uh, we don't want to talk about her. So she's, uh, she, there's a gesture toward her. She's the one of, uh, uh, the wife of Urias, but uh, it's um, interesting to see the Lord take note of that and just kind of move her aside. Uh, there are others in this list that, I mean, there are several kings here who are, who are actually wicked. Um, so it just has the feeling that the Lord wanted to make a point uh, concerning that episode. And Solomon begat Rehoboam, and Rehoboam and Abia, and Abia begat Asa, and Asa begat Josaphat. Josaphat begat Joram, and Joram begat Ozias, and Ozias begat Jotham, and Jotham begat Ahaz. And you can go back in Chronicles and the rest, and some are in uh, uh, Exodus, and, uh, and they match very well. So the um, scholars complain that some of them are skipped and it's like you know why did they do that so and ahaz begat echazias and echazias begat manassas and manasseh begat amon and amon begat josias and josias begat jehonias and his and his brethren so that's an interesting addition that it's just not one, but there's a collection. And maybe it's because that is on the threshold of them being taken captive into Babylon. About the time that they were carried away unto Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jechonias begat Salathia, and Salathia begat Jeroboam, and Jeroboam begat Ablud and Ablud begat Elakim and Elakim begat Azor. So, unless you're a fiend over names in the Bible, it's like uh, I don't, I don't get it. Uh, but it might be worth some energy to go back and uh, find out where they are mentioned again uh, historically. And Azor begat Sardak and Sardak begat Achim and Achim begat Elud. And Eliud begat Eleazar, and Eleazar begat Mathan, and Mathan begat Jacob. And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. And so, uh, for us as an English and an American reader, that process is somewhat painful. Um, we're not a part, we're not intimate with these characters. We don't, I don't think we spend the kind of time in the New Testament, I'm sorry, in the Old Testament where these names are each, each one a gem, but each one was uh, someone who was in the purposes of God. And the fact that some were evil, uh, I think just shows that God's will is still perfectly done, even though uh, the enemy does his best to try to to try to thwart it. And so, uh, then of course, Mary is uh, the final woman that is mentioned. So all of the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And so if you count the actual listing, uh, you'll see that that's exactly the case. And from David to the carrying away of Babylon, 14 generations. And the carrying way of Babylon to Christ are 14 generations. And so there are some things about that description that scholars find fault with. And that is that they can find names that makes it more than 14 or less than 14. And so they, they balk at the notion, which I'm not comfortable with. And so it seems to me that the Lord is conveying... Uh, Typology, perhaps, 14 is seven twice. Two is the number of witness, and of course, seven is the number of perfection, leaving the sense that these three sets are conformed precisely to God's will, even though the mind of man and the arm of flesh are having a heyday and doing whatever they want. Uh, yet he is still in perfect control. And that's a good message for today. Looks like things are too crazy to be recoverable, but all things are known to the Lord. And 
it says that a nation cannot extend its border without his permission. So he is ever present in all affairs. And we haven't really taught on that. I probably should. I, I mentioned it somewhat extensively in the uh, uh, Jesus author and finisher, but I'm feeling it. the term that is used is providence, the providence of God, which means that he is ever present and he is mindful of all things and he causes the grass to grow. And so he, he feeds the lions. And so he, he is actually quite active and modern um, scholarship has assigned him out past the planet Pluto, uh, content to having wound everything up, everything's just going to play out. But that's not the Bible picture at all. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When, as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, and so they were, in a, in a way, in Jewish law, they were actually married, but uh, the marriage, there was not a marriage ceremony just yet, and the, the consummation hadn't occurred. Before they came together, she was found with child. And of course, Luke provides a lot of details, and, you know, Gabriel comes and you know, full of, full of grace, and the Lord is with you. And uh, she says, how, how can these things be? He says, oh, the Holy Ghost will come upon you. So not much of that is present in Matthew's account. So she was found with, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. And so the Holy Spirit came upon her, and with the conditions of the supernatural interacting with the natural realm, uh, she conceived and uh, conceived a healthy child. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, you can imagine how he felt. You know, <laughs> here I am, I'm keeping everything right, and there she goes. And it's like, uh, but even though he had the authority to bring the hammer down, including death, by the way, that's the reward for adultery. Uh, he was a just man, and he figured, no, that's too heavy handed. And so he wasn't willing to make her a public example. And so he, his plan was, let's put her away privately. No one needs to know. Everything will stay cool. But while he thought on these things, the angel of the Lord is going to help. <laughs> Even though he's being generous, he still needs to realize what is actually happening. And and so the Lord speaks to him in a dream, appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, you son of David, don't fear to take unto you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Perfect explanation. And I find it interesting that the Lord speaks to him in a dream, and we'll see there are a number yet ahead of us where the Lord speaks to them in a, in a dream. Whereas the Lord spoke to Mary through Gabriel, the uh, the archangel. So, so the drama is now set where his heart is content to proceed in his fatherly capacity and uh, create an assurance that she is uh, respected, although... Uh, they used to say, everybody knows how to count the nines. So, so, some things can't be hidden. And she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And so this is Messiah. And just as Zacharias was commanded to call his child John, Joseph is commanded to call his child Jesus. Now all this was done that I might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, behold, a virgin shall be with child and she shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted in Hebrew, God with us. And so this is an Old Testament clue as to the nature of the coming of Messiah, that it will be a virgin that conceives. 
Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and he took unto him his wife. It's just like nothing happened. This is all okay. And he didn't know her until she had brought first her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus, just as he was instructed. Chapter 2. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. So this chronology here suddenly leaps over some of the other uh, descriptions of the birth of Jesus. Uh, no shepherds, uh, no, no manger, uh, but they go to describe the wise men who are likely to have been mystical, Eastern, uh, what's the word, uh, Occidental? No, it's uh, Oriental. Oriental means East, Occidental means West. So, And so they are unidentified. They are, they're certainly not from Judah. And so they're not Im immersed in the movings of God. And yet the Lord chooses them and gives them signs along with an understanding that they're being directed, they're being compelled um, to follow and to see to it that his will is done. Saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? So they, they make it to uh, Jerusalem. So they're asking around, for we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. So that, our, that star is also a little enigmatic. Evidently, this star moves uh, because they follow it. The, the, it, uh, it travels until it gets over where Jesus is. But they're traveling from east to west, uh, but the star is in the east. And so I suppose that that star first caught their attention in the east and then somehow made some sort of motion that they considered this is an invitation to follow the star. But I think it is likely that that star then headed west. And uh, when they got to Jerusalem, they felt this is, we're close. We, we ought to start asking around. And when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled. I don't like this. This is <laughs> this is not good. And all Jerusalem with him. So evidently the uh, the three wise men landed in Jerusalem and probably was asking around to everybody, and it troubled everybody. And of course, when news got to Herod, it troubled him uh, all the more. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together. He demanded of them where Christ should be born. So he's making plans that if he can corner this birth, then he can do something about it. And they said unto him in Bethlehem of Judea, because it's written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, and not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of you shall come a governor that shall rule my people, Israel. So the uh, the scribes and priests knew their scripture very well, and they know that Bethlehem is the target city. And so now Herod is equipped to um, execute a cunning plan, <laughs> as they say, lying between his teeth. Then Herod, when he had pr privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. So he's trying to get a feeling of motion. And it was it 20 years ago or Joe, it just happened. And so he's using this information uh, so that he can form a plan. And he sent them to Bethlehem because that's where the priests and the uh, scribes said he should be born and said, go and search diligently for the child, young child. And when you found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. 
not. So he's setting everything up so that he can destroy Jesus once all of this is known. And so when they heard the king, they departed, and then the star, which they saw in the east, went before them. So Bethlehem is just south of Jerusalem. And so evidently, the star moved, and instead of moving them west, now is moving them south. And it came and stood over where the young child was. So I guess the experience would be the star the star positions itself right over Jesus. And so as you're going and getting closer, the star is going to get higher and higher. And then when it's directly overhead, Jesus is right there somewhere. So, uh, so it wasn't a very difficult process to follow the star. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy, which hints that maybe the star wasn't there all the time, or maybe the star didn't move all the time. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child. So this language is now completely different. They didn't find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. It's not called a babe, he's called a young child. And they didn't come to a stable, they came to a house. So scholars feel that a significant length of time then has passed since Jesus was born. Possibly, remember, they all came to Bethlehem to be taxed. And once that taxation is over, everyone can leave. And the feeling is, well, maybe they stayed and found a home. And so when they were coming to the house and I saw the young child with Mary, his mother, they fell down and worshipped him. And that's another example where worship and and physical posture are linked. They fell down. Maybe they kneeled, knelt down and put their head to the floor. We don't know. Maybe they prostrated themselves. We don't know. But they fell down and worshipped him. That was their capability to give honor to the child Jesus. They, something in them just made it possible for them to see the greatness of this child that was born. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Of course, gold we know. Frankincense is a very expensive aromatic, uh, comes from a, a tree you cut, you cut into the bark and it kind of oozes out. One commentator said that if in a shop, shopping area, you had one bowl of, of um, incense or uh, like a perfume without myrrh, and next to it was, I'm sorry, without frankincense, and next to it was one with frankincense, that one would cost 10 times as much. And then myrrh is similar, uh, but it's also used, uh, Egyptians use it in, the, in embalming. So what it seems to me that the Lord did, he put it in the heart of these kings, don't know who they were, what their background was, but they had a clear instinct. And so they come and provide wealth. It easily could have been ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 worth of wealth. And I think the purpose of that was then that goes because uh, Joseph is, is about to be warned, you got to get out of here and go to Egypt. Well, it takes money to travel. You get to Egypt, you don't know anybody. You've got to rent a property or something. And so I think this was the Lord's way of funding uh, this poor family uh, throughout uh, the number of days that, it, uh, that that provision was able to assist. And being warned of God in the dream, so the wise men get a comeuppance and they get alerted that they should not return to Herod. So Herod's trickery falls flat because the Lord knows <laughs> and the Lord can talk. And so he can tell people what's going on. And they departed into their own country another way. And so if you look at a map, it would seem possible that traveling from 
the east and going, uh, say, to Amman, Jordan, and then through Jericho to Jerusalem, all of those are on a straight line. And all of those as a path are above the Dead Sea. Then they go south a little bit to Bethlehem. So it seems that if they're going to go back another way, they're not going to go back to, to uh, Jerusalem because people will see them and say, what gives? They, they, they want to sneak out of there. So I think they went south below the Dead Sea and then went east and up back to their home. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Same thing, another another revelation in the form of a dream saying arise and take the young child and his mother and flee unto Egypt and be you there until I bring you word for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him so it's very much like uh, Pharaoh angry and trying to kill the, the Jewish children uh, when Moses was born and then he arose and he took the young child and his mother by night. They were being careful. And they departed unto Egypt. So maybe they had to get some camels, <laughs> a wagon or something. And, the, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord, the prophet saying, out of Egypt, I have called my son. So the Lord is directing the historical development of the growth of Jesus and is seeing to it that it matches what prophecies have gone on before. And the Lord can do that today as well. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, he was exceedingly angry and sent forth and slew all of the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under so he's trying to make a calculation i want to be safe i want to make sure i'm getting up in age enough to actually get them and he decided three was too much and two was just right according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men so he tried to use everything that the wise men told him to execute this horrible plan it's the murder of children which still that spirit is still here today. Then was fulfilled that which spoken of by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, In Ramah there is a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted because they are not. And so this is a prophetic notion that um, that Rachel herself, in seeing this great slaughter, is greatly gr grieved. And uh, Rachel was buried near uh, Bethlehem. And I'm sure they don't know the exact place, but they do have a, a spot where they, where they honor. And she is honored at that spot by the Jewish people, by the Muslims, and by the Christians. But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. So this is the final escape plan finishing up, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead, which sought the young child's life. And he arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. So they... Uh, they went to Egypt. We have no way of knowing did they stop and maybe toward Alexandria or maybe toward um, Cairo or did they go deeper? Did they go up the Nile? We don't know. But they uh, they resided in the uh, in the country, and I did not look to see if there's an estimate as to the period of time that they were in Egypt. The feeling here, it wasn't that long. But when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of the father, Herod, he was afraid to go there, notwithstanding being warned of God. And so Herod's dead, but it's either his son or his grandson. 
uh, could have easily have been worse. And so it's like, it, we're not free to get back. We're, you know, it's kind of, we're heading into the same thing. But uh, being warned of God in a dream, again, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. So if you look at the geography, he probably hung, uh, hugged the coast. Uh, and Jerusalem is pretty far inland. And so that way they could get up to uh, the area of Nazareth without encountering, encountering uh, difficulty. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. I think I mentioned before that in Israel, Christians are called notesri, which is similar to the word Nazareth. And uh, the word means branch. We're called branches. Chapter 3. In those days came John the Baptist. So this is kind of making full circle. Remember, Mary, who is six months pregnant, goes to Elizabeth, who's about to have John the Baptist. And so that means Jesus and John the Baptist are about three months difference in age. But something changed in that process because when John the Baptist is ministering, he doesn't know how to identify Jesus. And God has to tell him on whom you see the Holy Spirit fall like a dove. And so uh, John the Baptist's mother and father were elderly. And so it's quite likely that they perhaps lived another five years or so. And um, evidently the relationship that Mary had with Elizabeth somehow became unworkable. And maybe John was gathered by a religious group of men who then took him to the wilderness and taught him the ways of the ascetic life. But whatever process was there before John was born uh, seems to have disappeared. So John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And I might say, um, when you travel to Israel, Judea has a lot of mountains and they're just dust. There's nothing that grows. Whereas that's the very same place that Lot wanted. Remember, Abraham said, make your choice. And so he went. Uh, to, to Jericho, be, I'm sorry, uh, um, I've forgotten the name of the city. It'll come to me later. But the Bible explains that the reason why he chose that was because it was just like Eden. So incredible growth and lushness. But by the time this occurs, that whole area is now barren. It's uh, That lushness had been completely destroyed. So John has a message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that, remember, we said the at hand means it's close by. It's not a timing uh, description, but it's closing in. It's, it's moving towards you. And so this appears as though John himself... Uh, had been under some sort of tutelage so that he, living in the desert, is becoming aware of the movement of God and is able to propose things prophetically. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And so John is standing up and preaching and the neighboring villages, even as far as Jerusalem and probably even further, heard of it and they all flock to him and they, uh, they listen intently because it's a rare occurrence that someone speaks 
so clearly when, and with such authority. And so the people were uh, drawn to that. Just a comment about making his paths straight. That, that's also in Isaiah. The idea is that if the king is coming, you don't want the roads in disrepair. You don't want them zigging and zagging. You, you want it to be straight so that he's not hindered and he's not having to navigate. But he can just head straight toward the goal. And you, the Bible also talks about casting up the stones. You don't, you don't want the horses tripping on anything. You want to make sure that when the king comes, he's not troubled uh, by people being careless and lack of attention. My point is, is that I believe we are in days where that same message is now part of the present truth. Make straight the way of the Lord. And Isaiah gives us a few components, and I've mentioned them before, but maybe we could go deeper sometime. The way you make, you prepare the way of the Lord is that every valley is exalted. Every mountain and hill is made low. The crooked is made straight, and the rough places plain. And those are the description of four different characteristics of the life of a Christian. A valid Christian is someone who needs to be lifted up. The enemy is constantly putting them down. You're no good. You're never going to make it. This is always how you've been. It's always how you're going to be. So preparing for the Lord, when you see someone like that, they need to hear the good news that God is with you. You know, he loves you. This, uh, you have a greater inheritance that you're able to see right now. The opposite of that is the mountain Christian. The mountain Christian, boy, he just swaggers. <laughs> He's got it on the, by the tail of the downhill pull, as they used to say, and he's got to be made low. It's, uh, and the Lord will use shame, he'll use failure, uh, rebuke, but it's necessary. The way, the way it's got to be right. The crooked way has to be straight. We can't have snake-like behavior. It's got to be made straight. And the rough place is plain, or the rough is... Uh, our, 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 the way we treat people, dismissive, you, know, you don't count, I do, you don't, and uh, that has to be shaved down, and that's the way we prepare the way of the Lord. And I think the Lord is calling us to that in some measure. I'm not sure it's in preparation of the day of the Lord, but it's certainly in preparation of a visitation, which I think is on God's calendar. And the same John had his raiment, his clothing of camel's hair and leathern girdle about his loins, and his food was locusts and wild honey. So he was an ascetic. He, uh, there were a class of um, strong believers who they just were so discontent with the normal hubbub of, of daily life, they fled to the wilderness and they <laughs> they... They uh, they refused pleasure. They refused opulence. They made it hard on themselves. And uh, after John the Baptist and after the resurrection, there were a group. Today, they're called the Desert Fathers. And they did the same as John. They just fled to the wilderness to worship the Lord and be alone with him. And we would say, you know, how foolish because you can't do any good. That's not how it worked, because when they went out to spend their time with the Lord, the people would flock to them. <laughs> I've got this problem. What do I do? So they would they would prophesy and give them instruction. <laughs> so uh, so they fled to them just like they did John the Baptist. So it's not uh, not a wasted venture in any regard. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and the region ar around about Jordan. So the people are flocking. And we're baptized of him in Jordan, confessing our sins. The modern church is particularly weak on confessing sins. We're not trained in it. 
We don't expect it. It's not set before us as any kind of a necessity. We don't like it because it's embarrassing. You know, I confess my sins to the Lord, and so that makes it okay. No, no, there's something about standing before someone who they themselves are skilled and being able to read what it is that you're saying and respond correctly. Sometimes you respond with compassion. It's okay. It's okay. Just get that behind you. You'll be all right. Other times they need to be scolded. This is a pattern. This is what you're doing. You need to stop. And that takes wisdom, which, which we don't have. I heard recently of one brother visiting another brother. They knew themselves for years, middle age, and one started to confess his sins to the other. And, uh, the second man heard them, and he confessed his sins back to the first guy. That's There's a ring to that. I like that. That is the willingness to just open, uh, experiencing the shame that you're admitting a sin because your heart is crying out for holiness. Your heart is crying out to be um, pleasing to the Lord. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to the baptism, here comes trouble. He said to them, he's not nice. Oh, generation of vipers, who's warned you to flee from the wrath to come? What are you doing here? How come it reached your ears? You know, it's because you're not going to pay any attention. So why, why should I even make any effort at all? Bring forth, therefore, fruit that's fit for repentance. If you're going to grow in the Lord, your behavior has to change. Your speech has to change. Your heart has to change. That's the purpose of repentance. You forsake the elements that are dark and dirty. And don't think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham to be our father. And to say, I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children of Abraham. You think you're close. You think you're just waiting for that final anointing and da da there you are. No. And then that sound like the uh, the, uh, uh, the the rabbis that chided Jesus on, on Palm uh, Sunday saying, you know, you quiet them down. And Jesus said, no, if you quiet them down, the stones, the stones will cry out. And so we have some sort of picture that somehow we're special we have a special niche that no one else has and you need to be careful of that because he's in, he is ever present judging what it is that we're saying and what we're doing and we it's the fear of the lord it's the apprehension lord i i have to know if am i on track am i slightly off and is my speech healthy does it build up or do i talk about myself that apprehension is necessary. And if you fumble and fumble and fumble, you can't rely on a special unction that says, well, I'll make it work anyway. He can turn to whoever he wants and raise them up without any effort at all. And now also the ax is laid under the root of the tree. It's coming down. Therefore, every tree which brings forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Remember, Jesus said the same thing. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you're not bearing fruit, you'll be cut off, and man will, men will burn you. We need to hear that often enough so that we recognize that our behavior is really under scrutiny. And having an experience of the Lord kind of not paying attention, at least that's what it feels like, the Lord not paying attention to what we're doing, that that makes it okay. That's perilous. You have to, you have to be sharp. You've got to be on it. And it's better, it's better to take a suspicion to the Lord uh, where he says, uh, eh, that's okay. You know, you got that backwards, but, but that's okay. Uh, it's, it's better to do that than to hide things and the Lord, you know, smoke is coming from his ears, and he's saying, oh, I don't like this at all. I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that comes after me is mightier than I, 
whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. I can't even, uh, you know, because the shoe is the lowest part of a person, and he's he's he can't even carry the shoes. He can't even touch them. He can't even make any kind of an assistance. And so there's this holy man of God proclaiming mighty words to the to the sinners that are there, and many confess their sins and are baptized, and yet he himself uh, just recognizes, I'm not, don't, don't look at me, I'm lower than the low. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And there's another drama. We're not bad at being baptized with the Holy Ghost. We are almost zero in understanding being baptized with fire. And so fire in the Bible has more than one component. Uh, there's the fire that comes from heaven that destroys, that burns, and it's the chaff. We want the chaff burned. But there's another fire which represents an earnest, an earnest worship, an intense love. Your heart is on fire for God, and the fire of his love joins your fire. And so being baptized in fire should have those two results. One is the chaff, it's got to go. Don't nurse it. Don't explain it away. Let it go. Let it be burned. Admit it. Just say, yeah, that's right, Lord. I, I say that all the time to people. And that's what I, I've seen them react. And now I realize it's me. It's, uh, uh, it needs to go. And then the second is to grow in your love in the Lord. And just uh, fire meets fire. It's wonderful. And it's much needed. Who's... Fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So we need, we need to understand the fear of the Lord. We need to realize, you know, we are comforted because we have a certain uh, breadth, a certain width that the Lord is pleased to help us to navigate, but there are edges to that. And sometimes I fear that the American Christian wants to see how close to the edge can I get and not fall over. And that's poor strategy. Stay in the middle, stay in the true. Don't even, don't even guess about what's on the perimeter. This is what's, this is what's on the perimeter, uh, being burned up with chaff and unquenchable fire. Then comes Jesus from Galilee to Jordan under John to be baptized of him. So the Lord has planned this connection, but notice it doesn't come through any natural means because John, John needs a sign as to who this man is. And of course, remember the Holy Spirit comes upon him with uh, like a dove. And so... They didn't grow up together in any kind of regard. They didn't, evidently, they didn't visit each other throughout their 30 years of history. But John said, no, no, I have need to be baptized of you. What a normal, honest expression, humble. He recognizes the son of glory. I can't even touch his shoelaces. He said, no, we got this backwards. But the Lord says something pretty remarkable. And John continues, and you, and you come to me? And Jesus answered and said, suffer it to be so. Now, just roll with it. Roll with it. For this, it becomes us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he suffered him. He let him do it. And so John saw a hindrance uh, out of his own sense of dignity. This isn't right. This is backwards. And the Lord com comforts him and says, no, this is okay. This is necessary. And that can happen in the Christian life where the Lord, where you're just kind of tied up and this can't proceed. This is not, it's not right. I'm, it's just, I'm feeling out of place. And then he gives you an assurance. No, you're right where I want you. And you're doing exactly what I called you to. That's a gift. It's a gift of grace. 
And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. Of course, the Baptists like to point out, he went under the water and came out. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. That's the anointing. That's the preparation. That's Pentecost for Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and all of the manifestations of the Spirit is now a part of him. Guidance, comfort, assurance, clarity of sight, um, being alert to uh, to be cautious in, uh, in, in areas where they need to be warned. And a voice from heaven saying, when you like the Lord talk from heaven and say, hey, this is my guy. And, uh, I don't know. He did it to Jesus, so that's a start. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And so the father speaks in uh, two other occasions. And so this is the first one where he testifies. He gives assurance to the people that are there. You better listen to him because he pleases me. And he, he is established in the calling that was prophesied by all the prophets. And it's now coming forward. The adventure is now beginning. So we're getting started in Matthew. There's so much yet ahead of us. So it, um, the four Gospels, there are a lot of similarities between them, but each one has something that is genuinely unique. And so that's, that's what we have yet coming to us in Matthew. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the majesty of your word. We thank you that we can pause and ponder and by the Holy Spirit see these things so clearly that it that it prods our hearts. It gives us a hope and it gives us the urge to press on toward you. And we pray that this testimony of the Holy Spirit will be our portion. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.